Hello and welcome to the German Guy Reviews. I am the German Guy. A long, long time ago, I reviewed the movie Bibi Blocksberg. And this is the sequel. So let's find out if it can give us some magical spice. We are not starting with the actual movie just now. I want to draw your attention to the music of the intro, and it's not so subtle not to another magical franchise. You know the rules, if one of us claims it, it's canon. Which is totally unfair, I shouldn't be the one to get copyright striked. They should. We open up the movie with a witch named Valpurgia, using her crystal ball to see how Rabia is doing after being sent to the swamp as punishment for her crimes in the first film. <laughs> Isn't it weird how in secret magical societies their laws have never evolved beyond the Middle Ages? Anyway, the evil sorceress curses the name of the person who got her into this situation, Bibi Blocksberg, and we cut over to the little girl herself who is in deep trouble after having failed a crucial math test this year and neglecting to mention this fact to her parents. Her ma and pa decide to send her to summer school this year, so she doesn't fall behind in her curriculum. This is just for your own good. First you ignore math, and before you know it, you are into deep dark magic and you sacrifice people to Satan. And can I just mention how very bitchy Bibi is this time around? I mean, it makes sense. The circumstances are crappy right now and she has entered puberty lane. What is it with teenage girls and becoming bumholes for a few years? Us boys become just horny. All the time. Anyhow, Bibi settles in and she absolutely hates it. Meanwhile, Rabia realizes that she can escape her prison because the canyon that surrounded her swamp got flooded via heavy rain. Okay, just got to swim across this river nice and slow. Shit! Bibi then shrinks her teacher. You have no power here, mortal. What is your puny math against my reality altering wizardry? Now, Bow. I'm the Homelander, mm -hmm. and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Seriously though, if magic users actually existed, would they have to be classified as walking weapons of mass destruction? Afterwards, she makes a new friend, a girl named Elea. They get talking and Bibi shows off her magic a bit. She says they should do a race to the bookstore where she lives. Um. Bibi might have a slight advantage here, and it's not for the reason that you think. Have you ever seen these medieval cobblestone streets? They are not exactly wheelchair friendly. At the bookstore, Elea tells Bibi there is a legend about a labyrinth beneath the school, leading to an incredible treasure, but no one has found it yet. Hey Frank, why are we not supposed to renovate here? Don't know, but it explicitly says this area is not to be touched ever. What wouldn't I give for a treasure hunting movie where the twist is that there never was any kind of magical artifact and the ancient king just built a temple with all kinds of traps so that people would stop asking about it. 
Shortly later, the young lady, missing her parents, sends a letter to her mom asking for advice, giving Rabia the opportunity to sneak into their house in the hopes of finding a way to regain her magic powers that were taken from her as part of her punishment. She breaks in and drinks every potion that she can get her hands on. I hope to God that was alcohol. No! I also would have expected a Gremlins 2 situation now with lots and lots of mutating. <laughs> then, out of nowhere, uh, I completely forgot about this, she starts to sing. This film is like a Frankenstein monster made out of all the parts of other popular kids movies. They now only need to start to get self-aware, early 2000s style, or give us some, at that time, state-of-the-art CGI animation to make the picture complete. You aren't going to rap, right? You are not, right? You are not, right? God, knowing that this could happen at any time feels like having a bomb strapped under your car seat. Rabia reads the manuscript of the book that Bibi's mother is writing and just happens to stumble upon the passage talking about the origin of magic. It's the dust of the blue owl. One last bottle is supposedly hidden beneath the school Bibi is attending. So she quickly gets on her broomstick and brooms brooms away. Mother and daughter have a fight. Bibi accusing her mom of being a coward for not daring to heal Elea's affliction as it is against the codex. She mentions that there is only one witch powerful enough that could do such a thing. The person from the beginning, her aunt Valpurgia. So that same night our heroine sets out to find her. At the mighty witch's home, that looks like one of the houses from the dinosaurs, we learn what Rabia already knows. There were once blue owls whose dust created incredible magic and could cure almost any ailment. So it's back to school. Where? Oh no, 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 go away, there's still time! Immediately afterwards, Valpurgia checks in on Rabia and realizes that she has escaped. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. But were all of these witches just cramped behind the wall and waiting for their moment to be useful? God, now I miss silly spoof movies again. Anyhow, Bibi pays Alea a visit. She didn't got all that much information, but she did learn that there might be something in the library. Their first attempt is pretty fruitless. The next day, Bibi is busy with a paddleboard race. Rabia steals the manuscript of Bibi's mother to get more information on the blue owls, after learning that it could prove useful when she talked with the dead. The evil witch then jeopardizes the boat race. You would think this is a good moment to get Bibi into a dangerous, even life-threatening situation with this. But nope, hard cut and she is fine. Just a bit wet. And cold. Beware Rabia the menace! She might put a bucket full of water above the doorframe next. Elea shows Bibi an old map that one of her relatives still had lying around. It shows the entrance to the labyrinth beneath the school. Rabia derwal uses a truth serum on the principal, who we are told has been looking for the blue owl as well. The two girlfriends at the same time find a secret passage that is revealed by trying to take out a specific book in the school's library. 
I like how this puzzle presupposes that the students don't read. But what is never mentioned in this sort of situation is, what if I want to read that book? Yeah, I, I don't care about the secret tomb of Bob Christ, Jesus' long lost brother. I want 50 egg recipes around the world. They walk around for a bit until the trapdoor gets them. When they have stopped sliding down, they see that before them is a gigantic labyrinth and it looks like alphabet soup. If they end up solving math problems because this was all just an elaborate way for parents to go, see, this is why you shouldn't neglect learning, I'm going to literally murder you. But no, they open up another door and find themselves, surprisingly, back at Alea's bookstore. So they go back to school, where Rabia is performing a magic show. For no reason at all. Is this what a villain identity crisis looks like? In reality, this was just a way for Rabia to get close to Bibi. Okay, I could think of at least a dozen other ways, but whatever. Meanwhile, the witch police is on the hunt for Rabia. There is this entire naked gun style witch police plot that is just happening in the background and I want this so much more than the actual story. Back to Bibi, who is tricked by Rabia into telling her where the owl dust is hidden. She then goes back to the library, where the principal is also making his move. Mother and father show up with Bibi's aunt to bring her to safety. Daddy falls down the trapdoor, leaving his wife behind. Bibi has enough and decides that tonight is the night she and Elea will get their hands on the owl dust. Man, all dust, man, seriously, it unlocks the deep knowledge. You will feel like Athena herself. I'm not dead by the seventh stair. I'm getting a new dealer. <laughs> they have a run in with Rabia, who hunts them for a while until Bibi summons her broom and flies away. The two girls then unplug an underground lake, leading to one final riddle. They have to create a pentagram with owl statues. And now for the finishing touch. Virgin's blood! Shortly later, the principal, the dad and Rabia holding her hostage show up as well. For once, the husband is useful too. He knocks out the evil witch, making it possible for Bibi and her best friend to go through undisturbed. On the other side, they have a vision where Elea can walk again. She meets the ghost of her parents, who died years ago in an accident. They gift her a small token of an owl. They then come back from their little trip in the afterlife. It is then that the magic SWAT team arrives to arrest and punish Rabia right then and there. She receives the highest possible sentence, the removal of all her magic powers with zero chance of ever getting them back. So they line up for a bewitching firing squad. And by god, this scene almost makes me feel bad for Rabia, seeing her in this magical electric chair. Who? Who removed the sponge? After she turns into an old harmless lady, she leaves the scene and the principal gets his memories wiped. Sometime later, Bibi is overjoyed after she successfully passed her exams. Elia is back in her wheelchair, but finds out by chance that inside the mini owl there was a little magic dust. It doesn't make her walk again, however, but gives her an owl of her own. Great! Now I have a pet that I don't want and can't afford to take care of. Thanks, ghost parents! And that was Bibi Blocksburg and the Secret of the Blue Owls. It's not very exciting. Having watched this and being reminded by the movie itself via its choice of music of Harry Potter, I can see why one works infinitely better than the other. The Harry Potter world feels magical. You see them do wizardry in class. There's constantly stuff to remind you of the presence of magic in the world. The Bibi Blocksburg films are too much grounded in the real world, so you never feel as if you're leaving for something exciting.
One scene that perfectly exemplifies this is the first time when they go to the labyrinth. Other films would at this point make a clear cut between the world of magic and the non-magic world. Usually you would let the heroes not out of the dungeon until the mystery is solved. But in this story there is literally a shortcut to Elea's old home, back to their school, back to everyday life. The beginning of the film, where we get to see Rabia's prison in the swamp, was actually quite exciting. I want to see more of that world. I know what an actual school looks like. I have been there for way longer than I intended. Also, if you are already ripping off the Potterverse, then you might as well make a magic school instead of a regular one. Am I right? The other thing is, Bibi never is in any real danger. At least it doesn't feel that way. Rabia does stuff, but the worst thing she does is play a few pranks on Bibi and steal a bit of magic. It feels to me, even if she managed to get her hands on her in the labyrinth, she would not do anything too bad to her. And she is supposed to be the worst criminal that the magical world ever saw? Truly the wizard equivalent of Charles Manson. Also, there were two songs in the film. Two. One for Rabia, celebrating her return, and the other of the girls, ugh, singing about boys and love and shit. At least the former contributed and commented on the plot. So not only was the second one garbage, it was pointless. And with that, we leave Bibi Blocksberg behind. Maybe we will return to her at some point, but for now, I have more than enough education in that subject. The German guy out and auf Wiedersehen.